Hello everyone. In this lecture, I will start talking about mythology and religion associated with the moon. Fittingly, Chandrayaan 2, a lunar mission that's named after the Indian deity of the moon, has a lander that will touch down near the lunar south pole this Friday. The blue dot shows the planned landing site of the Vikram lander. The orange dot marks the location of the Apollo 11 landing site. Note the distance between the two sites is rather significant. It's about 2,200 kilometers, or about 1,400 miles, which is equivalent to driving from Johns Hopkins University to Houston, Texas. Last week, I talked briefly about the many topics related to the moon that I would like to cover in this course. This week, I want to focus on mythology and religion, but I want you to keep in mind that we want to look for connections. I think it is interesting to find links between these topics than to just consider them separately. Let's begin with some highly simplified definitions of religion and myth. You may have different definitions, and that's okay. For this lecture, I will consider religion as a broad subject that includes stories, beliefs, rituals, texts, and sacred places. I define myths as stories that are associated with religions. As we discuss these topics, I want to ask that you be respectful. Whether religions or myths, they have meaning to different people, so it's important to keep that in mind. Our goal is to learn about the connections that myths and religions have to the moon, not to assign value judgments. What is the moon? Try putting yourself in the context of people living hundreds or even thousands of years ago. Imagine yourself in a time before telescopes, a theory of gravity, or spacecraft. Before about 1609, there were no telescopic observations of the moon. Before publication of Newton's Principia in 1687, we didn't have a theory of gravity to explain why the moon orbits the Earth. Even close observations of the moon only began with the Soviet Union's Lunar 2 spacecraft in 1959. On the left and the right are paintings from the 1700s showing people looking up at the moon. What do you think people were wondering when they looked at the moon? They could probably notice that the moon goes through phases that it's typically present at night. On rare occasions, it has eclipses that it doesn't seem to rotate and shows the same side to us. Perhaps some of them notice the darker markings on the surface and try to make sense of what they were. In many Western cultures, the dark markings on the moon are considered to form the man in the moon. We saw this depicted in the movie A Trip to the Moon last week. It's possible that the notion of the man in the moon came to Western culture from Mani, from Norse mythology. Mani is on the left in the middle drawing with soul on the right. You may see the man in the moon or you may see some other pattern. On the right are various interpretations. Let's take a closer look at the rabbit on the moon shown on the second row. The rabbit, or sometimes hare on the moon, is depicted in a number of cultures through different time periods. On the left is the Maya moon goddess holding a rabbit. In the middle is the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl. While Quetzalcoatl isn't a moon deity, it's said that Quetzalcoatl came down to the earth in the form of an old man and found himself hungry as he was going through a forest. A rabbit, seeing that the old man was hungry, offered himself as food by jumping into a fire. For the kind gesture, Quetzalcoatl honored the rabbit by elevating the rabbit to the moon. On the top right, you can see an image of the moon with a rabbit depicted on its surface. Notice that the rabbit is working a border with a pestle. The Chinese myth of the jade rabbit explains that the rabbit is in charge of making the elixir of immortality. Let's take a closer look at this myth. I'm going to talk about two versions of this myth. The first version talks about how the emperor came down to the earth in the form of an old man. He was walking through a forest and was hungry. He asked a monkey, a jackal, and a rabbit for some food. Each went out to get food for the old man. While the monkey and jackal were able to bring back food for the old man, the rabbit couldn't provide food since the rabbit could only gather grass. Since humans don't eat grass, the rabbit jumped into a fire so that the old man could eat him. Seeing the sacrifice made by the rabbit, the emperor took and placed the rabbit in the palace of the moon. The second version of this myth is a bit more involved. 
Wugan was an immortal in charge of making the elixir of immortality, which immortal beings needed to take every thousand years to stay immortal. On a trip to the earth, Wugan gave some of the elixir to a few humans. This was not allowed, and the emperor was upset at Wugan. As punishment, Wugan was charged with cutting down a tree that would keep growing every time he cut it down. Now the emperor needed someone to continue making the elixir of immortality, so he asked three divine beings to go down to earth to find a replacement. The three divine beings took on the form of three old men as they came to the earth. As they were going through a forest, they asked for help finding food. The fox and the monkey found food for them, but the rabbit was not successful. The rabbit jumped into a fire to sacrifice himself so that the three old men could eat him. Seeing that the rabbit was selfless and thinking that the rabbit would be a good candidate to be in charge of making the elixir of immortality, the three divine beings took the rabbit to the heaven. One day, the queen mother of the west came to the rabbit and asked for some elixir. The rabbit knew that he was not supposed to give out the elixir, so he initially refused. But the queen mother insisted and the rabbit gave in, giving some elixir to the queen mother. When the emperor found out, he was mad at the rabbit for giving out elixir. But since the rabbit was forced, the emperor allowed the rabbit to pick his own punishment. The rabbit chose to be sent to the moon forever since he felt that was an appropriate punishment. Why did the rabbit think that being sent to the moon was appropriate? Well, to see that, we need to talk about Chang'e. Before these events, the emperor had ten sons who took the form of ten sons, S-U-N-S. -S. I think they were in rebellion. This made life on earth quite miserable since it was extremely hot. The emperor then asked Hoi, an archer, who is immortal, to teach the emperor's sons a lesson. When Hoi visited the earth, he saw how bad life was because of the heat, so he shot and killed nine of the ten sons, leaving just one son. This explains why we have one son today. After this, the emperor was upset set at Hoi for killing nine of his sons. So the emperor made Hoi and his wife Chang'e into mortals and banished them to her. This is where the story links to the story of the Jade Rabbit. Hoi went to the queen mother on earth and asked her to help him and his wife. This is where the queen mother gave Hoi the elixir that she got from the Jade Rabbit. As she gave the elixir to Hoi, she mentioned that if he wanted to live forever on earth, then he should take half of the elixir. But if he wanted to become immortal and return to the heavens, he should drink all of the elixir. Hoi thought that was fine since he only wanted half for himself and half for his wife. When he was back with Chang'e while he was sleeping, without knowing the caveat about taking half of the elixir, Chang'e drank all of it. This made Chang'e immortal and lifted her up to the heavens where she was to live in the palace on the moon. Thus, it seems that the Jade Rabbit felt that none of this would have happened had he not given the elixir to the Queen Mother. As such, he thought keeping Chang'e company on the moon was appropriate. Interestingly, the myth of Chang'e as a link to Apollo 11. Here's a portion of the mission transcript before the landing on the moon between the capsule communicator Ron Evans and the command module pilot Michael Collins. Among the uh, large headlines concerning Apollo this morning is one asking that you watch for a lovely girl with a big rabbit. An ancient legend says a beautiful Chinese girl called Chang'o has been living there for 4,000 years. It seems uh, she was banished to the moon because she stole the pill of immortality from her husband. You might also look for her companion, a large Chinese rabbit, who is easy to spot since he is always standing on his hind feet in the shade of a cinnamon tree. The name of the rabbit is not reported. Okay, we'll keep a close eye for the bunny girl. <laughs> Roger. I think they were trying to be funny, but as I mentioned before, it's important to be respectful. China National Space Administration has been naming its missions to the moon after Chang'e. Chang'e 4 is an active mission that landed on the far side of the moon, the side that we can't see from the Earth. The orange dot shows the landing site. The image at the top shows the view from Chang'e 4, and you'll notice the rover, the rover U-2-2, since U-2 means Jade Rabbit in Mandarin. Also in the news recently, you may have seen that this mission found an unusual gel-like substance on the moon. 
I don't think we know yet what that substance is, but I think it's cool that there's still many things to learn about the moon. Next, let's look at the Japanese myth of Kaguya. The story of Kaguya is part of the tale of the bamboo cutter. In the story, an old bamboo cutter is in the forest and he finds an infant who is the size of his thumb. In another version of the story, the infant is found inside a stalk after the old man cut a bamboo tree. Since the old man did not have children, he took the infant to raise her with his wife. They named the infant Kaguya. Surprisingly, after having found Kaguya, every time the old man cut a bamboo tree, he would find a nugget of gold. So the family became pretty wealthy as Kaguya grew up. As a woman, Kaguya was approached by five suitors who wanted to marry her. I think in a way to get them to go away, she assigned each of them impossible tasks of finding specific items for her. All five failed in their pursuits of finding the items. After this, the emperor of Japan visited the family. He also wanted to marry Kaguya, but she refused him as well. Over time, it's said that she became sad when she saw the moon and told her parents that she needed to return to her people on the moon. There are different reasons why she was perhaps on Earth, one being that there was a celestial war that was going on. Beings from the moon then came down to take Kaguya home. They told the bamboo cutter that the gold that he has been finding over the years was a stipend for taking care of Kaguya. The beings from the moon then gave Kaguya the elixir of life to help her return to the moon. Kaguya took some of it but wanted to give the rest to her old foster father. But the beings from the moon would not allow her to do that. Instead, Kaguya managed to send the rest of the elixir along with the letter to the emperor. Having realized that Kaguya had returned to the moon, the emperor was distraught and sent the elixir and the letter to Mount Uji since it was closest to the heavens, being the highest point of Japan. People believed that smoke coming from the mountain was from the burning of the elixir and Kaguya's letter. It's possible that the mountain is named from the word for immortality in Japanese. As with Chang'e, there was a mission by the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency called Kaguya that was active between 2007 and 2009. The image on the left is an image taken by the Kaguya spacecraft looking back at Earth. The image on the right is a computer simulated view of Kaguya in orbit around the moon. Now let's look at the Indian god Chandra, who is a moon deity. It's thought that Chandra rides a chariot across the sky representing the motion of the moon across the sky. The chariot is either pulled by 10 white horses or antelope. One story of Chandra is that he had an affair with Ara, who is the wife of Rihaspati, the deity Jupiter. In another version of the story, Chandra is said to have abducted Dara. Chandra and Dara have a child called Bhu, the deity Mercury, not to be confused with the Buddha. Because of how Bhu was conceived, it is said that Bhu does not like his father Chandra. After this, Chandra married the 27 daughters of Daksha, on the condition that Chandra not favor one of the 27 more than the others. When Chandra violated this condition, Daksha is said to have diminished the light that Chandra produces, thus explaining what Chandra, or in other words the moon, goes through phases each month. Again, like Chang'e and Kaguya, the Indian Space Research Organization names its missions to the moon after Chandra. The current mission is Chandrayaan-2, with Chandrayaan meaning mooncraft in Sanskrit. On the left is an image taken by the Chandrayaan-2 orbiter. On the right is the Vikram lander and the Pragyan rover in a clean room. As I mentioned in the beginning, the landing is planned for this Friday. I'll talk more about Greek mythology next week, but for now, I want to point out the Greek goddess of the moon is Selene, and the Roman equivalent is Luna. It's from the Roman goddess that we get the adjective Luna, which we use for things like lunar topography or lunar gravity. Now, I'd like you to pause for a few minutes and ponder on the following. I mentioned a few myths associated with the moon, and I want you to identify a particular myth that you found interesting. Can you find something about that myth that I didn't mention? Also, what are the similarities and differences between these myths? How do you think these myths or Originated. Also, consider the gender of the moon in these myths. Switching topics a bit, remember how I asked you to imagine living hundreds or even thousands of years ago? What do you think they would have seen when they looked at the moon? As this animation shows, they probably noticed that the moon goes through phases every month, and they may have wondered why it does that. In this particular animation, you may also notice that the moon seems to nod up and down and side to side a bit. This is interesting, and we'll come back to why the moon does that in a future lecture. For now, let's focus on the phases of the moon.
There must have been many explanations for the phases of the moon. I found this particular one quite interesting. Anaximander lived between about 610 to 546 BCE and was the first to consider a mechanical model of explaining the motions of the sun and the moon. The drawing on the right tries to illustrate Anaximander's model, but note that unlike the original model, the illustration shows the Earth as a sphere. Anaximander thought that the Earth was a cylinder. He proposed that there were several wheels spinning above of the earth. These wheels had fire filled inside them. He thought that what we perceive as the moon, for example, is just a hole in the inside rim of one of the wheels. As pictured on the left, imagine if you took a wheel and removed one spoke. There would be a small hole. Anaximander thought that the fire inside the wheel was coming through one hole. The sun would be one wheel and the moon would be another wheel. In the case of the moon, the hole would change shape to account for the monthly phases. Heraclitus, who was around in 500 BCE, had another interesting idea. He proposed that the sun and the moon were each bowls of fire that were rotating. In the diagram above, imagine Earth being towards the bottom. In the current orientation of the bowls, you would not see either the sun or the moon. As the bowls rotated, you would start to see the fire in each bowl. This model tried to explain both the phases of the moon and eclipses. Also, the fire was thought to be sustained by vapor that arose through the heavens from Earth. Now take another look at the animation that shows the phases of the moon. Take a few minutes to think about what you think causes the phases of the moon. If you're not sure, try to come up with your own explanation. Here's an animation that helps us think about the phases. In this animation, you can see the Earth rotating and the moon revolving around the Earth. The Earth takes about 24 hours to rotate, while the moon takes about a month to go around the Earth. Here the sun is at the bottom illuminating both the earth and the moon. Now picture yourself on the night side of the earth and watching the moon. Do you notice how the portion of the moon that is lit changes over time? Another thing that people would have noticed is that occasionally the moon would disappear. This animation shows a lunar eclipse. In the past, some people thought that witches could make the moon disappear. This Thessalian trick appears in the comedy play called The Clouds, where a person is trying to avoid paying interest on a loan. To do that, they plan on having a witch take down the moon. Since interest is assigned at the end of the month, they think that if they get rid of the moon, then the end of the month cannot be marked and they would not have to pay up. So, what do you think causes eclipses? Again, take a few minutes to think about this for yourself. Here's an animation that helps. You may have said that lunar eclipses are caused by the Earth's shadow blocking sunlight. That's true, but then would you expect a lunar eclipse every month since the moon would be behind the Earth in approximately 30 days? This animation shows that the reason why eclipses are rare is that the orbit of the moon is slightly inclined with respect to the orbit of the earth around the sun. It's only on some occasions when everything lines up to produce an eclipse. Let's take a look at one last effect with the lunar eclipses. If you've seen a lunar eclipse, you might have noticed that the moon changes color as it goes through an eclipse. It turns a red color. Doesn't that seem a bit odd for the moon to be inside the shadow of the earth but then change color. This animation shows how the brightness of the moon drops as it goes behind the earth, but then that color change happens. This is because a bit of sunlight going through the Earth's atmosphere makes it to the moon. Notice that if you could look towards the sun from behind the Earth, you would see a red halo or ring around the Earth. That's the red light that makes it to the moon. This scattering that takes place in Earth's atmosphere is also the reason why sunsets are reddish in color. 